that's the scene of the crime. I was doing box jumps from here to there. I was going to do three sets of 15. Uh, and on my first set, on the 14th rep, I was okay. Then on the 15th, my foot went here. It slipped off. And my shin just went poof. That's my blood right there. And this is what it looks like so far. Great, isn't it? How about this way then, eh? <laughs> so the year is 2002. I had been bumping around for about eight, nine, eight, nine months, freelancing after my dot-com crashed and burnt. And at the time, I was actually quite getting quite sick of client management, you know, being nice to clients who were actually quite nasty. And uh, I was quite sick of it all, and I thought it would be nice to have a nice regular salary for once in my, for once, for the first time in years, right? So I put my feelers out, made a few phone calls, and then one of them came back from a guy called T.H. Chan, who was the bureau chief of Bloomberg Kuala Lumpur in those days. And I called him up and I said, hey, um, he said to me, there's a spot available as a spot reporter in the KL office. And basically a spot reporter is someone who covers anything and everything, right? Um, general news, current affairs, politics, stock market, whatever, right? So then I applied. And in those days at Bloomberg, you have to have at least four interviews to become a journalist there and a written test to just try and get a gauge of your proficiency or not at financial markets so I made it through the first few rounds you know Malaysia interview Singapore interview a Hong Kong interview did the test was all right then the final interview was with a man himself Michael Bloomberg and in those days he was still running Bloomberg as CEO and he interviews everybody everybody who joins Bloomberg has to be interviewed by him personally on the phone the only thing is the difference was he only asked you one question and I had to call him up, 6 o'clock New York time, uh, which meant I had to stay up, or rather wake up at 6 a.m. Malaysia time to call him up. And the one thing he asks you is this. What is the most important rule in journalism? What is the most important rule in journalism? Accuracy. Accuracy. And because I already knew the answer, because I was briefed beforehand, I got the job. And I spent three amazing years, very challenging years, to be honest, um, but three amazing years at Bloomberg, where I really discovered the huge, immense edge that professional investors have over the retail guy, the everyday Joe. Some of the functions, I mean, the Bloomberg itself is incredible. It is so good. It is a machine par excellence in terms of the technical abilities that allow you to analyze any asset class in the world. This is the machine. First of all, some caveats. I'm only going to cover a few select pages, the ones that I go through normally. And um, obviously, I've only got five minutes or so, which, I'm, which I've only got. So um, I'm not going to be able to cover the whole functionality of the Bloomberg. So this is just a very, very light snapshot of the functions that I use most commonly. Okay. So the top worldwide screen on my left and my um, snapshot of the index benchmarks and the ring and the currencies on my right are the ones that I normally go to first. Top worldwide, of course, gives you all the top stories. Obviously, Bitcoin's in the news because it's um, had a huge crash along with other crypto, so you can see a whole bunch of news there. Bitcoin, Tencent, S&P, Iran, etc., etc. On the right, you'll see the Southeast Asian inch benchmark indexes, the KLCI is there down well over 3% so far this year, uh, and so on and so forth. Then at the bottom, you've got a very nice quilt of all the top currencies versus the Southeast Asian currencies. So the one that applies to me the most is the ringgit at 4.146. So that's a very nice snapshot. Moving on to what is the very much um, the flavor of the day. This is Bitcoin just for the one year basis, year to date. So again, very powerful. You can see how Bitcoin at the start of the year was 29,000 bucks. Hit a high of just nearly 65,000, back now down to about 40,000, jumping all over the shop. And um, you can also maybe hopefully see RSI, which is a relative strength index, 
how much buying, how much selling on the stock. So obviously you can see that um, Bitcoin is down at 30 on the RSI, which means it's probably oversold. And it's a good indicator to buy, obviously. Now this is a 50 day, 100 day and 200 day moving average. That's all very interesting. So now down, down around about 40,000. Let's go to gold. Now gold is interesting as well. It's XAU currency description page. That's how I usually land on. And this is obviously gold spot. I got a graph and you can see how the graph is going. Again, hit a high of about 2060 bucks in uh, June last year, August last year. And right now at about 1900 bucks an ounce uh, in May. So again, jumping all over the place. And then the other thing I like to look at is ECFC. ECFC is um, economic forecasts. And you can see Asia Pacific, Malaysia's down there. Let's look at Malaysia. So 6% actual, actual, actual. Then 2021, these are the forecasts. So these are a collection of eco economists who have contributed their forecasts to uh, to the charts. And if you click through the Malaysia specifically, you can see all the economists that have contributed their calls. You can also change this to quarterly. And you can see that quarterly, Malaysia is expected to go up, to rise by 16.7% in the second quarter. Second only to India's 246 whether or not they'll get there, who knows? What else is there? Let's look at uh, some equities for now. Everybody's favorite stock, Apple. Apple Inc. Again, I'd like to stop by on the description page. And this is a snapshot. You can see 52 week high, 52 week low. You can see the dividend yields. You can see the price earnings ratio. Very nice snapshot here. Uh, just to drill down a little bit, you can look at who the management team are. Tim Cook, obviously, if you click through on Tim Cook. You can see that Tim Cook owns some stock in the company. He has got over three and a bit million shares in the company, which is worth 418 million US dollars. And that's quite a good indicator because if the CEO has got stock in the company, that means his interests are most likely to be aligned with you. And also he's got some stock in Nike because he used to work there as a director. He's got about 31,000 shares and that's worth 4.3 million US dollars. Just to go back to the description page again, DVD is dividend, so you can look at the dividend history. That's always good because if you're an income investor, that's always good to know. So in 2021, so you can see that they've already paid three times, I think. Uh, payable in February, in May, and uh, obviously in August. So going back again to the description page, gross yield on Apple is 0.7%, which is not great per se, but it's better than 0%. And it's a company which is worth 2.1 US trillion US dollars, which is very, very interesting. I also like to see PHDC. PHDC is, of course, the ownership structure. And the more institutionalized the company, the better, because it just shows that the more institutional investors you have, the more established you are because of all the rules and corporate governance that they demand of you. So Vanguard is uh, the biggest owner outside of um, the business, which is They've got 7.4%. BlackRock has got 6.3%. Berkshire Hathaway of Warren Buffett has got 5.4%. Uh, so 1.2 uh, million shares. No, 1.2 billion, 1 billion shares? That should be quite a lot. Okay, what else do I like to see? I, look, I like to look at financial analysis, which is FA. And this is a very nice 8 to 10 year snapshot of the business financials. So just to expand this out. If you look at it in 2013, Apple was only worth 434 million US dollars. Today, they're worth 2.1 trillion dollars. So you can see, even for a mega cap like that, they can still rise. They can still get bigger by five times over just a seven-year cycle. Uh, revenue is also important: 171 million US dollars uh, eight years ago. Today, nearly double that: 325 million billion US dollars. And of course, uh, net income, the all-important net income, 37 billion dollars eight years ago today twice that 76 billion US dollars what else is interesting um, analyst coverage ENC you can see 44 analysts cover the stock just one is a sell and then you can toggle along the columns to see who is the most optimistic Red Bush just uh, Danny Ives 185 dollars he reckons it's a uh, iPhone replacement super cycle so he's got a huge buy call on uh, Apple 185 dollars which is some way higher than today's $125. And uh, the most pessimistic is a guy called 
Abhinav Davuluri from Morningstar, $115. US dollars. Lastly, let's look at um, RV. RV is relative value. Here you can compare Apple against its competitors. Hewlett Packard, Western Digital, Samsung, HP, Fujitsu. Still the biggest dog in the room, $2.1 trillion versus the average market value of just $58 billion and so on and so forth. Very, very powerful machine indeed. US dollar, MYR. That's the dollar versus the ringgit where I'm based. And most unfortunately, the ringgit has been on a steady decline versus the dollar for the last 20 years, 30 years, whatever you want to call it. Boof, there you go. Not the prettiest charts, but it does show the competitiveness of the Malaysian economy. At one point in time, it was worth 3 to the dollar. Today, it's worth four to the dollar it was actually worth as much as two ringgit to the dollar back in 1980 but that was a long time ago eve of lockdown man but look at bangsa Woo. it's happening right no thank you 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 thank Honey, you do me wrong, but still I'm crazy about you.